Part One of Black Amazon of Mars by Lee Brackett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. Part One of Black Amazon of Mars by Lee Brackett. Chapter One Through all the long, cold hours of the Norland night, the Martian had not moved nor spoken. At dusk of the day before, Eric John Stark had brought him into the ruined tower and laid him down, wrapped in blankets on the snow. He had built a fire of dead brush, and since then the two men had waited alone in the vast wasteland that girdles the polar cap of Mars. Now, just before dawn, Kamar the Martian spoke. Stark. Yes. I am dying. Yes. I will not reach Kushat. No. Kamar nodded. He was silent again. The wind howled down from the northern ice, and the broken walls rose up against it, brooding, gigantic, roofless now, but so huge and sprawling that they seemed less like walls than cliffs of ebon stone. Stark would not have gone near them but for Kamar. They were wrong somehow, with a taint of forgotten evil still about them. The big earthman glanced at Kamar, and his face was sad. A man likes to die in his own place, he said abruptly. I am sorry. The Lord of Silence is a great personage, Kamar answered. He does not mind the meeting place. No, it was not for that I came back into the Nordlands. He was shaken by an agony that was not of the body. And I shall not reach Kushat. Stark spoke quietly using the courtly High Martian almost as fluently as Kamar. I have known that there was a burden heavier than death upon my brother's soul. He leaned over, placing one large hand on the Martian's shoulder. My brother has given his life for mine. Therefore, I will take his burden upon myself if I can. He did not want Kamar's burden, whatever it might be, but the Martian had fought beside him through a long guerrilla campaign among the harried tribes of the nearer moon. He was a good man of his hands, and in the end had taken the bullet that was meant for Stark, knowing quite well what he was doing. They were friends. That was why Stark had brought Kamar into the bleak north country trying to reach the city of his birth. The Martian was driven by some secret demon. He was afraid to die before he reached Kushad, and now he had no choice. I have sinned, Stark. I have stolen a holy thing. You're an outlander. You, you would not know of Ban Kruach and the talisman that he left when he went away forever beyond the gates of death. Kamar flung aside the blankets and sat up, his voice gaining a febrile strength. I was born and bred in the thieves' quarter under the wall. I was proud of my skill, and the talisman was a challenge. It was a treasured thing, so treasured that hardly a man has touched it since the days of Ban Kruach who made it. And that was in the days when men still had the luster on them, before they forgot that they were gods. Guard well the gates of death, he said. That is the city's trust, and keep the talisman always, for the day may come when you will need its strength. Who holds Kushat? holds Mars, and the talisman will keep the city safe. I was a thief, and proud, and I stole the talisman. His hands went to his girdle, a belt of worn leather with a boss of battered steel, but his fingers were already numb. Take it, Stark. Open the boss, there, on the side where the beast's head is carved. Stark took the belt from Kamar and found the hidden spring. The rounded top of the boss came free. Inside it was something wrapped in a scrap of silk. I had to leave Kushat, Kamar whispered. I could never go back, but it was enough to have taken that. He watched, shaken between awe and pride and remorse, as Stark unwrapped the bit of silk. 
Stark had discounted most of Kamar's talk as superstition, but even so he had expected something more spectacular than the object he held in his palm. It was a lens some four inches across, man-made, and made with great skill, but still only a bit of crystal. Turning it about, Stark saw that it was not a simple lens, but an intricate interlocking of many facets, incredibly complicated, hypnotic if one looked at it too long. What is its use? he asked of Kamar. We are as children. We have forgotten, but there is a legend, a belief, that Ban Kruach himself made the talisman as a sign that he would not forget us, and would come back when Kushat is threatened, back through the gates of death to teach us again the power that was his. I do not understand, said Stark. What are the gates of death? Kamar answered. It is a pass that opens into the black mountains beyond Kushat. The city stands guard before it. Why, no man remembers except that it is a great trust. His gaze feasted on the talisman. Stark said, You wish me to take this to Kushat? Yes, yes, and yet... Kamar looked at Stark, his eyes filling suddenly with tears. No, the North is not used to strangers. With me you might have been safe, but alone. No, Stark, you have risked too much already. Go back out of the Norlands while you can. He lay back on the blankets. Stark saw that a bluish pallor had come into the hollows of his cheeks. Kamar, he said, and again, Kamar! Yes. Go in peace, Kamar. I will take the talisman to Kushat. The Martian sighed and smiled, and Stark was glad that he had made the promise. The riders of Mecca are wolves, Kamar said suddenly. They hunt these gorges. Look out for them. I will. Stark's knowledge of the geography of this part of Mars was vague indeed, but he knew that the mountain valleys of Mecca lay ahead and to the north, between him and Kushat. Kamar had told him of these upland warriors. He was willing to heed the warning. Kamar had done with talking. Stark knew that he had not long to wait. The wind spoke with the voice of a great organ. The moons had set, and it was very dark outside the tower except for the white glimmering of the snow. Stark looked up at the brooding walls and shivered. There was a smell of death already in the air. To keep from thinking, he bent closer to the fire, studying the lens. There were scratches on the betzel, as though it had been held some time in a clamp or setting, like a jewel. An ornament, probably, worn as a badge of rank. Strange ornament for a barbarian king in the dawn of Mars. The firelight made tiny dancing sparks in the endless inner facets. Quite suddenly he had a curious feeling that the thing was alive. A pang of primitive and unreasoning fear shot through him, and he fought it down. His vision was beginning to blur, and he shut his eyes, and in the darkness it seemed to him that he could see and hear. He started up, shaken now with an eerie terror, and raised his hand to hurl the talisman away. But the part of him that had learned with much pain and effort to be civilized made him stop and think. He sat down again. An instrument of hypnosis? possibly. And yet that fleeting touch of sight and sound had not been his own, out of his own memories. He was tempted now, fascinated like a child that plays with fire. The talisman had been worn somehow. Where? On the breast? On the brow? He tried the first, with no result. Then he touched the flat surface of the lens to his forehead. The great tower of stone rose up monstrous to the sky. It was whole, and there were pallid lights within that stirred and flickered, and it was crowned with a shimmering darkness. He lay outside the tower on his belly, and he was filled with fear and a great anger, and a loathing such as turns the bones to water. There was no snow. There was ice everywhere rising to half the tower's height, sheathing the ground. Ice cold and clear and beautiful and deadly. He moved, he glided snake-like with infinite caution over the smooth surface. The tower was gone, and far below him was a city, 
He saw the temples and the palaces, the glittering lovely city beneath him in the ice, blurred and fairy-like and strange, a dream half glimpsed through crystal. He saw the ones that lived there, moving slowly through the streets. He could not see them clearly, only the vague shining of their bodies, and he was glad. He hated them, with a hatred that conquered even his fear, which was great indeed. He was not Eric John Stark. He was Ban Cruach. The tower and the city vanished, swept away on a reeling tide. He stood beneath a scrap of black rock, notched with a single pass. The cliffs hung over him, leaning out their vast bulk as though to crush him, and the narrow mouth of the pass was full of evil laughter where the wind went by. He began to walk forward into the pass. He was quite alone. The light was dim and strange at the bottom of that cleft. Little veils of mist crept and clung between the ice and the rock, thickened, became more dense as he went farther and farther into the pass. He could not see, and the wind spoke with many tongues, piping in the crevices of the cliffs. All at once there was a shadow in the mist before him, a dim, gigantic shape that moved toward him, and he knew that he looked at death. He cried out. It was Stark who yelled in blind, atavistic fear, and the echo of his own cry brought him up, standing, shaking in every limb. He had dropped the talisman. It lay gleaming in the snow at his feet, and the alien memories were gone, and Kamar was dead. After a time he crouched down, breathing harshly. He did not want to touch the lens again. The part of him that had learned to fear strange gods and evil spirits with every step he took, the primitive aboriginal that lay so close under the surface of his mind, warned him to leave it, to run away, to desert this place of death and ruined stone. He forced himself to take it up. He did not look at it. He wrapped it in the bit of silk and replaced it inside the iron boss and clasped the belt around his waist. Then he found the small flask that lay with his gear beside the fire and took a long pull, and tried to think rationally of the thing that had happened. Memories. Not his own, but the memories of Ban Cruach a million years ago in the morning of a world. Memories of hate, a secret war against unhuman beings that dwelt in crystal cities cut in the living ice and used these ruined towers for some dark purpose of their own. Was that the meaning of the talisman, the power that lay within it? Had Ban Cruach, by some elder and forgotten science, imprisoned the echoes of his own mind in the crystal? Why? Perhaps as a warning, as a reminder of ageless alien danger beyond the gates of death. Suddenly one of the beasts tethered outside the ruined tower started up from its sleep with a hissing snarl. Instantly Stark became motionless. They came silently on their padded feet, the rangy mountain brutes moving daintily through the sprawling ruin. Their riders, too, were silent, tall men with fierce eyes and russet hair, wearing leather coats and carrying each a long, straight spear. There were a score of them around the tower in the windy gloom. Stark did not bother to draw his gun. He had learned very young the difference between courage and idiocy. He walked out toward them, slowly, lest one of them be startled into spearing him, yet not slowly enough to denote fear, and held up his right hand and gave them greeting. They did not answer him. They sat their restive mounts and stared at him, and Stark knew that Kamar had spoken the truth. These were the riders of Makah, and they were wolves. Chapter 2 Stark waited until they should tire of their own silence. Finally, one demanded, Of what country are you? He answered, I am called Nachaka, the man without a tribe. It was the name they had given him, the half-human aboriginals who had raised him in the blaze and thunder and bitter frosts of Mercury. A stranger, said the leader and smiled. He pointed at the dead Kamar and asked, Did you slay him? He was my friend, said Stark. I was bringing him home to die. Two riders dismounted to inspect the body. One called up to the leader. 
He was from Kushat, if I know the breed, Thord, and he has not been robbed. He proceeded to take care of that detail himself. A stranger, repeated the leader, Thord, bound for Kushat with a man of Kushat. Well, I think you will come with us, stranger. Stark shrugged, and with the long spears pricking him, he did not resist when the tall Thord plundered him of all he owned except his clothes and Kamar's belt, which was not worth the stealing. His gun Thord flung contemptuously away. One of the men brought Stark's beast and Kamar's from where they were tethered, and the Earthman mounted, as usual, over the violent protest of the creature, which did not like the smell of him. They moved out from under the shelter of the walls into the full fury of the wind. For the rest of that night and through the next day and the night that followed it they rode eastward, stopping only to rest the beasts and chew on their rations of jerked meat. To Stark, riding a prisoner, it came with full force that this was the North Country, half a world away from the Mars of spaceships and commerce and visitors from other planets. The future had never touched these wild mountains and barren plains. The past held pride enough. To the north the horizon showed a strange and ghostly glimmer where the barrier wall of the polar pack reared up, gigantic against the sky. The wind blew down from the ice through the mountain gorges across the plains, never ceasing. And here and there the cryptic towers rose, broken monoliths of stone. Stark remembered the vision of the talisman, the huge structure crowned with eerie darkness. He looked upon the ruins with loathing and curiosity. The man of Makah could tell him nothing. Thord did not tell Stark where they were taking him, and Stark did not ask. It would have been an admission of fear. In mid-afternoon of the second day they came to a lip of rock where the snow was swept clean, and below it was a sheer drop into a narrow valley. Looking down, Stark saw that on the floor of the valley, up and down as far as he could see, were men and beasts and shelters of hide and brush and fires burning. By the hundreds, by the several thousand, they camped under the cliff, and their voices rose up on the thin air in a vast deep murmur that was deafening after the silence of the plains. A war party gathered now, before the thaw. Stark smiled. He became curious to meet the leader of this army. They found their way single file along a winding track that dropped down the cliff face. The wind stopped abruptly, cut off by the valley walls. They came in among the shelters of the camp. Here the snow was churned and soiled and melted to slush by the fires. There were no women in the camp, no sign of the usual cheerful rabble that follows a barbarian army. There were only men hillmen and warriors, all tough-handed killers with no thought but battle. They came out of their holes to shout at Thord and his men and stare at the stranger. Thord was flushed and jovial with importance. "'I have no time for you,' he shouted back. "'I go to speak with the Lord Ciaran. Stark rode impassively, a dark giant with a face of stone. From time to time he made his beast curvet, and laughed at himself inwardly for doing it. They came at length to a shelter larger than the others, but built exactly the same and no more comfortable. A spear was thrust into the snow beside the entrance, and from it hung a black pennant with a single bar of silver across it, like lightning in a night sky. Beside it was a shield with the same device. There were no guards. Thord dismounted, bidding Stark to do the same. He hammered on the shield with the hilt of his sword, announcing himself. Lord Ciaran, it is Thord, with a captive. A voice toneless and strangely muffled spoke from within. Enter, Thord. Thord pushed aside the hide curtain and went in, with Stark at his heels. The dim daylight did not penetrate the interior. Cressets burned, giving off a flickering brilliance and a smell of strong oil. The floor of packed snow was carpeted with furs, much worn. Otherwise there was no adornment and no furniture but a chair and a table, 
both dark with age and use, and a pallet of skins in one shadowy corner with what seemed to be a heap of rags upon it. In the chair sat a man. He seemed very tall in the shaking light of the cressets. From neck to thigh his lean body was cased in black link mail, and under that a tunic of leather dyed black. Across his knees he held a sable axe, a great thing made for the shearing of skulls, and his hands lay upon it gently as though it were a toy he loved. His head and face were covered by a thing that Stark had seen before only in very old paintings, the ancient war mask of the inland kings of Mars. Wrought of black and gleaming steel, it presented an unhuman visage of slitted eye-holes and a barred slot for breathing. Behind, it sprang out in a thin, soaring sweep, like a dark wing, edge-on in flight. The intent, expressionless scrutiny of that mask was bent not upon Thord, but upon Eric John Stark. The hollow voice spoke again from behind the mask. Well? We were hunting in the gorges to the south, said Thord. We saw a fire. He told the story of how they had found the stranger and the body of the man from Kushat. Kushat, said Lord Sierran softly. Ah, and why, stranger, were you going to Kushat? My name is Stark, Eric John Stark, Earthman, out of Mercury. He was tired of being called stranger. Quite suddenly he was tired of the whole business. Why should I not go to Kushat? Is it against some law that a man may not go there in peace without being hounded all over the Norlands? And why do the men of Maka make it their business? They have nothing to do with the city. Thord held his breath, watching with delighted anticipation. The hands of the man in armor caressed the axe. They were slender hands, smooth and sinewy, small hands it seemed for such a weapon. We make what we will our business, Eric John Stark. He spoke with a peculiar gentleness. I have asked you, why were you going to Kushat? Because, Stark answered with equal restraint, my comrade wanted to go home to die. It seems a long, hard journey just for dying. The black helm bent forward in an attitude of thought. Only the condemned or banished leave their cities or their clans. Why did your comrade flee Kushat? A voice spoke suddenly from out of the heap of rags that lay on the pallet in the shadows of the corner. A man's voice, deep and husky, with the harsh quaver of age or madness in it. Three men beside myself have fled Kushat. Over the years that matter, one died in the spring floods, one was caught in the moving ice of winter, one lived. A thief named Kamar, who stole a certain talisman. Stark said, my comrade was called Greshi. The leather belt weighed heavily about him, and the iron boss seemed hot against his belly. He was beginning now to be afraid. The Lord Siren spoke, ignoring Stark. It was the sacred talisman of Kushat. Without it, the city is like a man without a soul. As the veil of Tanit was to Carthage, Stark thought, and reflected on the fate of that city after the veil was stolen. The nobles were afraid of their own people, the man in armor said. They did not dare to tell that it was gone. But we know. And, said Stark, you will attack Kushat before the thaw, when they least expect you. You have a sharp mind, stranger. Yes, but the great wall will be hard to carry even so. If I came bearing in my hands the talisman of Ban Kruach, he did not finish, but turned instead to Thord. When you plundered the dead man's body, what did you find? Nothing, Lord. A few coins, a knife, hardly worth the taking. And you, Eric John Stark, what did you take from the body? With perfect truth, he answered, nothing. Thord, said the Lord Siren, search him. Thord came smiling up to Stark and ripped his jacket open. With uncanny swiftness the earthman moved. The edge of one broad hand took Thord under the ear, and before the man's knees had time to sag, Stark had caught his arm. 
He turned, crouching forward, and pitched Thord headlong through the door flap. He straightened and turned again. His eyes held a feral glint. The man has robbed me once, he said. It is enough. He heard Thord's men coming. Three of them tried to jam through the entrance at once, and he sprang at them. He made no sound. His fists did the talking for him, and then his feet as he kicked the stunned barbarians back upon their leader. Now, he said to the Lord Searin, will we talk as men? The man in armor laughed, a sound of pure enjoyment. It seemed that the gaze behind the mask studied Stark's savage face, and then lifted to greet the sullen Thord who came back into the shelter, his cheeks flushed crimson with rage. Go, said the Lord Searin. The stranger and I will talk. But, Lord, he protested, glaring at Stark, it is not safe. My dark mistress looks after my safety, said Searin, stroking the axe across his knees. Go. Thord went. The man in armor was silent then. The blind mask turned to Stark, who met that eyeless gaze and was silent also. And the bundle of rags in the shadows straightened slowly and became a tall old man with rusty hair and beard, through which peered craggy juts of bone and two bright small points of fire, as though some wicked flame burned within them. He shuffled over and crouched at the feet of the Lord Searin, watching the Earthman, and the man in armor leaned forward. I will tell you something, Eric John Stark. I am a bastard, but I come of the blood of kings. My name and rank I must make with my own hands, but I will set them high, and my name will ring in the Norlands. I will take Kushat. Who holds Kushat holds Mars and the power and the riches that lie beyond the gates of death. I have seen them, said the old man, and his eyes blazed. I have seen Ban Kruach the Mighty. I have seen the temples and the palaces glitter in the ice. I have seen them, the Shining Ones. Oh, I have seen them, the beautiful, hideous ones. He glanced sidelong at Stark. Very cunning. That is why Otar is mad, stranger. He has seen. A chill swept Stark. He too had seen, not with his own eyes, but with the mind and memories of Ban Kruach of a million years ago. Then it had been no illusion, the fantastic vision opened to him by the talisman now hidden in his belt. If this old madman had seen. What beings lurk beyond the gates of death I do not know, said Sirin. But my dark mistress will test their strength and I think my red wolves will hunt them down once they get a smell of plunder. The beautiful, terrible ones, whispered Otar, and, oh, the temples and the palaces and the great towers of stone. Ride with me, Stark, said the Lord Seer and abruptly. Yield up the talisman and be the shield at my back. I have offered no other man that honor. Stark asked slowly, Why do you choose me? We are of one blood, Stark, though we be strangers. The Earthman's cold eyes narrowed. What would your red wolves say to that? And what would Otar say? Look at him, already stiff with jealousy and fear lest I answer yes. I do not think you would be afraid of either of them. On the contrary, said Stark, I am a prudent man. He paused. There is one other thing. I will bargain with no man until I have looked into his eyes. Take off your helm, Siren, and then perhaps we will talk." Otar's breath made a snake-like hissing between his toothless gums, and the hands of the Lord Siren tightened on the haft of the axe. No, he whispered, that I can never do. Otar rose to his feet, and for the first time Stark felt the full strength that lay in the strange old man. Would you look upon the face of destruction? he thundered. Do you ask for death? Do you think a thing is hidden behind a mask of steel without a reason? That you demand to see it? He turned. My lord, he said, by tomorrow the last of the clans will have joined us. After that we must march. Give this earthman to Thord for the time that remains, and you will have the talisman. 
The blank, blind mask was unmoving, turned toward Stark, and the Earthman thought that from behind it it came a faint sound that might have been a sigh. Then, Thord, cried the Lord Searin, and lifted up the axe. Chapter 3 The flames leaped high from the fire in the windless gorge. Men sat around it in a great circle the wild riders out of the mountain valleys of Maca. They sat with the curbed and shivering eagerness of wolves around a dying quarry. Now and again their white teeth showed in a kind of silent laughter, and their eyes watched. He is strong, they whispered one to the other. He will live the night out, surely. On an outcrop of rock sat the Lord Siren, wrapped in a black cloak, holding the great axe in the crook of his arm. Beside him, Otar huddled in the snow. Close by, the long spears had been driven deep and lashed together to make a scaffolding, and upon this frame was hung a man, a big man, iron-muscled and very lean, the bulk of his shoulders filling the space between the bending shafts, Eric John Stark of Earth, out of Mercury. He had already been scourged without mercy. He sagged of his own weight between the spears, breathing in harsh sobs, and the trampled snow around him was spotted red. Thord was wielding the lash. He had stripped off his own coat, and his body glistened with sweat in spite of the cold. He cut his victim with great care, making the long lash sing and crack. He was proud of his skill. Stark did not cry out. Presently Thord stepped back, panting, and looked at the Lord Searin, and the black helm nodded. Thord dropped the whip. He went up to the big, dark man and lifted his head by the hair. Stark, he said, and shook the head roughly. Stranger! Eyes opened and stared at him, and Thord could not repress a slight shiver. It seemed that the pain and indignity had wrought some evil magic on this man he had ridden with and thought he knew. He had seen exactly the same gaze in a big snow-cat caught in a trap, and he felt suddenly that it was not a man he spoke to but a predatory beast. Stark, he said, where is the talisman of Ban Cruach? The Earthman did not answer. Thord laughed. He glanced up at the sky where the moons rode low and swift. The night is only half gone. Do you think you can last it out? The cold, cruel, patient eyes watched Thord. There was no reply. Some quality of pride in that gaze angered the barbarian. It seemed to mock him, who was so sure of his ability to loosen a reluctant tongue. You think I cannot make you talk, don't you? You don't know me, stranger. You don't know Thord, who can make the rocks speak out if he will. He reached out with his free hand and struck Stark across the face. It seemed impossible that anything so still could move so quickly. Yet there was an ugly flash of teeth, and Thord's wrist was caught above the thumb joint. He bellowed, and the iron jaws closed down, worrying the bone. Quite suddenly Thord screamed, not for pain, but for panic. And the rows of watching men swayed forward, and even the Lord Searin rose up, startled. Hark! ran the whispering around the fire. Hark! how he growls! Thord had let go of Stark's hair and was beating him about the head with his clenched fist. His face was white. Werewolf! he screamed. Let me go, beast thing! Let me go! But the dark man clung to Thord's wrist, snarling and did not hear. After a bit there came the dull crack of bone. Stark opened his jaws. Thord ceased to strike him. He backed off slowly, staring at the torn flesh. Stark had sunk down to the length of his arms. With his left hand Thord drew his knife. The Lord Siren stepped forward. Wait, Thord. It is a thing of evil, whispered the barbarian. Warlock, werewolf. Beast! He sprang at Stark. The man in armor moved, very swiftly, and the great axe went whirling through the air. It caught Thord squarely where the cords of his neck ran into the shoulder, caught and shore on through. There was a silence in the valley. 
The Lord Searin walked slowly across the trampled snow and took up his axe again. I will be obeyed, he said, and I will not stand for fear, not of God, man, nor devil. He gestured toward Stark. Cut him down, and see that he does not die. He strode away, and Otar began to laugh. From a vast distance Stark heard that shrill, wild laughter. His mouth was full of blood, and he was mad with a cold fury. A cunning that was purely animal guided his movements then. His head fell forward, and his body hung inert against the thongs. He might almost have been dead. A knot of men came toward him. He listened to them. They were hesitant and afraid. Then, as he did not move, they plucked up courage and came closer, and one prodded him gently with the point of his spear. "'Prick him well,' said another. "'Let us be sure.' The sharp point bit a little deeper. A few drops of blood welled out and joined the small red streams that ran from the wheels of the lash. Stark did not stir. The spearman grunted. He's safe enough now. Stark felt the knife blades working at the thongs. He waited. The rawhide snapped, and he was free. He did not fall. He would not have fallen then if he had taken a death wound. He gathered his legs under him and sprang. He picked up the spearman in that first rush and flung him into the fire. Then he began to run toward the place where the scaly mounts were herded, leaving a trail of blood behind him on the snow. A man loomed up in front of him. He saw the shadow of a spear and swerved and caught the haft in his two hands. He wrenched it free and struck down with the butt of it and went on. Behind him he heard voices shouting and the beginning of turmoil. The Lord Searin turned and came back, striding fast. There were men before Stark now, many men, the circle of watchers breaking up because there had been nothing more to watch. He gripped the long spear. It was a good weapon, better than the flint-tipped stick with which the boy Nachaka had hunted the giant lizard of the rocks. His body curved into a half-crouch. He voiced one cry, the challenging scream of a predatory killer, and went in among the men. He did slaughter with that spear. They were not expecting attack. They were not expecting anything. Stark had sprung to life too quickly and they were afraid of him. He could smell the fear on them. Fear not of a man like themselves, but of a creature less and more than man. He killed and was happy. They fell away from him, the wild riders of Makah. They were sure now that he was a demon. He raged among them with the bright spear, and they heard again that sound that should have not come from a human throat, and their superstitious terror rose and sent them scrambling out of his path, trampling on each other in childish panic. He broke through, and now there was nothing between him and escape but two mounted men who guarded the herd. Being mounted, they had more courage. They felt that even a warlock could not stand against their charge. They came at him as he ran, the padded feet of their beasts making a muffled drumming in the snow. Without breaking stride, Stark hurled his spear. It drove through one man's body and tumbled him off, so that he fell under his comrade's mount and fouled its legs. It staggered and reared up, hissing, and Stark fled on. Once he glanced over his shoulder. Through the milling, shouting crowd of men he glimpsed a dark, mailed figure with a winged mask, going through the ruck with a loping stride and bearing a sable axe raised high for the throwing. Stark was close to the herd now, and they caught his scent. The Nordland brutes had never liked the smell of him, and now the reek of blood upon him was enough in itself to set them wild. They began to hiss and snarl uneasily, rubbing their reptilian flanks together as they wheeled around, staring at him with lambent eyes. He rushed them. Before they could quite decide to break, he was quick enough to catch one by the fleshy comb that served it for a forelock, held it with savage indifference to its squealing, and leaped to its back. Then he let it bolt, and as he rode it, he yelled a shrill, brute cry that urged the creatures on to panic. The herd broke, stampeding outward from its center like a bursting shell. Stark was in the forefront, 
Clinging low to the scaly neck, he saw the men of Maka scattered and churned and trampled into the snow by the flying pads. In and out of the shelters, kicking the brush walls down, lifting up their harsh reptilian voices, they went racketing through the camp, leaving behind them wreckage as of a storm, and Stark went with them. He snatched a cloak from off the shoulders of some petty chieftain as he went by, and then twisting cruelly on the fleshy comb, beating with his fist at the creature's head, he got his mount turned in the way he wanted it to go, down the valley. He caught one last glimpse of the Lord Siren, fighting to hold one of the creatures long enough to mount, and then a dozen striving bodies surged around him, and Stark was gone. The beast did not slacken pace. It was as though it thought it could outrun the alien body thing that clung to its back. The last fringes of the camp shot by and vanished in the gloom, and the clean snow of the lower valley lay open before it. The creature laid its belly to the ground and went, the white spray spurting from its heels. Stark hung on. His strength was gone now, run out suddenly with the battle madness. He became conscious now that he was sick and bleeding, that his body was one cruel pain. In that moment, more than in the hours that had gone before, he hated the black leader of the clans of Maka. That flight down the valley became a sort of ugly dream. Stark was aware of rock walls reeling past, and then they seemed to widen away, and the wind came out of nowhere like the stroke of a great hammer, and he was on the open moors again. The beast began to falter and slow down. Presently it stopped. Stark scooped up snow to rub on his wounds. He came near to fainting, but the bleeding stopped, and after that the pain was numbed to a dull ache. He wrapped the cloak around him and urged the beast to go on, gently this time, patiently, and after it had breathed it obeyed him, settling into the shuffling pace it could keep up for hours. He was three days on the moors. Part of the time he rode in a sort of stupor, and part of the time he was feverishly alert, watching the skyline. Frequently he took the shapes of thrusting rocks for riders, and found what cover he could until he was sure they did not move. He was afraid to dismount, for the beast had no bridle. When it halted to rest he remained upon its back, shaking his brow beaded with sweat. The wind scoured his tracks clean as soon as he made them. Twice in the distance he did see riders, and one of those times he burrowed into a tall drift and stayed there for several hours. The ruined towers marched with him across the bitter land, lonely giants fifty miles apart. He did not go near them. He knew that he wandered a good bit, but he could not help it, and it was probably his salvation. In those tortured badlands, riven by ages of frost and flood, one might follow a man on a straight track between two points. But to find a single rider lost in that wilderness was a matter of sheer luck, and the odds were with Stark. One evening at sunset he came out upon a plain that sloped upward to a black and towering scarp, notched with a single pass. The light was level and blood-red glittering on the frosty rock so that it seemed the throat of the pass was aflame with evil fires. To Stark's mind, essentially primitive and stripped now of all of its acquired reason, that narrow cleft appeared as the doorway to the dwelling place of demons as horrible as the fabled creatures that roam the dark side of his native world. He looked long at the gates of death, and a dark memory crept into his brain. Memory of that nightmare experience when the talisman had made him seem to walk into that frightful pass, not as Stark, but as Ban Cruach. He remembered Otar's words. I have seen Ban Cruach the Mighty. Was he still there beyond those darkling gates, fighting his unimagined war alone? Again, in memory, Stark heard the evil piping of the wind. Again the shadow of a dim and terrible shape loomed up before him. He forced remembrance of that vision from his mind by a great effort. He could not turn back now. There was no place to go. His weary beast plodded on, and now Stark saw, as in a dream, that a great walled city stood guard before that awful gate. 
He watched the city glide toward him through a crimson haze, and fancied he could see the ages clustered like birds around the towers. He had reached Kushat, with the talisman of Ban Croat still strapped in the blood-stained belt around his waist. End of Part 1 of Black Amazon of Mars by Lee Brackett